Behind many successful physician owners lies a silent struggle, a deeply felt sense of professional isolation. Physician-owned practices can profoundly impact their communities by fostering personalized patient care, promoting local economic growth, and preserving a sense of familiarity and trust. Today, we're going to talk about the benefits and downsides of owning a private practice, focusing on overcoming or avoiding professional isolation. Welcome to Thriving Practice. I'm your host, Tracy Cherpesky, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. If you're new, welcome and thank you for joining us. Our mission at Thriving Practice is to bring you evergreen content from a business operations perspective. We pack each episode with tips and tools to grow your practice without sacrificing your happiness or well being. Our goal is to help you take back your time, scale your practice, and elevate your leadership. Now, let's talk about some of the many benefits of owning and leading your own practice. I'm going to list them out and tell you a little bit, little bit about each one. So starting with autonomy and control, owning a private practice allows you to have greater control over how you care for your patients. You can also set your own working hours, decide on the services you want to offer and develop your own practice philosophy. This level of autonomy can lead to a more personalized and patient centered approach to healthcare. Another benefit, financial independence. Operating a successful medical practice can be financially rewarding. You have the potential to earn a higher income compared to working for a hospital or larger healthcare organization. Your earning potential is really only limited by your imagination, like for real. Listen to episode 104 on the benefits of embracing an entrepreneurial mindset to learn how you can increase your earning potential. Financial independence. Operating a successful medical practice can be financially rewarding. You have the potential to earn a higher income compared to working for a hospital or a larger healthcare organization. Your earning potential is only limited by your imagination, like for real. Listen to episode 104 on the benefits of embracing an entrepreneurial mindset to learn how you can increase your earning potential. Additionally, You have more control over the practice's financial decisions, and you can potentially benefit from the business's financial success. Flexibility and services. Within your own practice, you can tailor the services you provide to meet the specific needs of your patients and the community you serve. You can introduce innovative treatments or specialized services that may not be readily available in larger healthcare institutions, which could make your practice more unique and appealing to patients in your community and beyond. We had a client who started a regenerative medicine practice in a very small rural community, and it took a while, but once people learned about the benefits of a healthy lifestyle combined with regenerative medical support and interventions, oh, it took off. It provided a healthy stream of income for the provider owner or client while providing a service not otherwise available to that community. Running a private practice also allows you to establish stronger connections with your patients. Long-term patient relationships can lead to better continuity of care, improved patient satisfaction, and a deeper understanding of individual healthcare needs. Certainly our clients who are practice owners, tell us that they see higher compliance and lower anxiousness around visiting their their provider. You get to create a positive work environment. This is a big one, eh? Just think about your experience um, before you started your practice. Hopefully it's markedly different. So as the owner of a medical practice, you have the opportunity to shape the work culture and environment according to your values and preferences. You get to, I'm saying you get to, may not happen, but hopefully you do it. You get to foster a supportive and collaborative team leading to a more satisfying and rewarding workplace for yourself and your staff. Now, those are some benefits to owning a practice. However, unlike a hospital or larger practice where social contact contact and networking is practically built in, owning a practice or really any business for that matter can feel quite isolating. As a physician owner or provider owner, your team is likely made up of just you, possibly a handful of other providers, and your clinical support and admin teams. That's it. Now, if you've been following our blog or listening to this podcast, 
or maybe even have attended our roundtables or masterclasses, you might not be surprised to learn that isolation and loneliness are major contributors to physician burnout. Over 70% of physicians who have attempted suicide are solo providers. Now, this data seems to support our thesis that there is an urgent need for providers, particularly physician owners, to actively seek and nurture relationships to help avoid feelings of isolation and to feel supported professionally. Now, I feel compelled to add, having mentioned suicidal ideation, that if you are experiencing suicidal thoughts, please contact your local emergency medical facility or in the U.S. and Canada, you can call or text your local suicide prevention number. In the U.S. and Canada, it is 988. Now, we know it's not healthy to live in isolation. It can have several downsides to one's well being, which I'm about to share. And it's kind of a long list, so hang with me here. If you've listened to episode 101, that's our round table on burnout, you will notice that a lot of what I'm about to list here is identifiable identifiable in the progression of burnout. So let's learn about some of the downsides to working in isolation. Also, if you want to learn more specifically about burnout, go listen to episode 101. It's longer than our normal episodes because it is a round table. So it's a little over an hour long, uh, but it's definitely worth a listen. So here are some of the downsides to working in isolation. And by isolation, I really mean if you're in a small practice where you do not have other providers or you do not have a community around you or an organization or something where you are with other like-minded providers or business owners or provider owners, something like that, people who are kind of doing similar things to you, this is what we mean by working in isolation. So let's talk about it loneliness and isolation. So isolation at work can lead to feelings of loneliness, which can negatively impact mental health and can result in increased stress, anxiety, and even depression. Decreased motivation is another potential challenge. Without the presence of colleagues or a structured work environment, motivation can suffer. The absence of external accountability and social interaction can lead to decreased focus and efficiency. This is hugely important for practice owners who wear multiple hats as practice leader, provider, business strategist, and CEO. Working in isolation might limit your opportunities for skill development and learning from other people. Collaborative environments often foster the exchange of ideas and knowledge, which can be lacking when you work alone. Now, I'm currently the only consultant in my company, so this is one of the reasons I'm always part of a mastermind community or engaged in a business coaching program for myself. <sighs> Another potential downside of working alone, burnout and overwork. So isolated providers may struggle to establish clear boundaries between work and personal life, leading to overwork and burnout. Oh, this is a big one for our clients. <laughs> It can be challenging to disconnect and recharge. Many of our clients struggle with this in their first few years of practice ownership. I have yet to meet any business owner who hasn't needed to overcome this on some level. So in case you're wondering if there's something wrong with you, I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing wrong with you. This is very common. Another potential downside to working in isolation is decreased job satisfaction. Now, this is the, one of the th reasons and one of the things that we think is like going to be so great working in our own pri private practice, right? A lot of times our, our clients start their practices thinking they're going to feel better about what they do and they'll enjoy it more, but this is sometimes can have a negative effect of being on their own fully. So the lack of camaraderie and shared experiences with like-minded professionals can diminish job satisfaction human interaction, teamwork, and recognition from colleagues or contemporaries play a significant role in how individuals perceive their work environment. So keep this in mind. If you, you know, feel like you're slightly dissatisfied and you're wondering what's up, what gives, it could simply, could be a lot of things, but it could simply be you need more interaction with other professionals at the level that you're working at. So other practice owners or you know, shared owners or people who are doing similar things to you. 
Another interesting potential downside to working in isolation is that it can hinder effective communication. This can lead to misunderstandings, misinterpretations, and difficulties in conveying complex ideas. It can hamper project collaboration and hinder your progress. This is often a challenge for challenge for our clients, and we spend a considerable amount of time and energy developing effective communication strategies and tactics. Sometimes what happens is we're in our own heads and it makes a lot of sense to us. It, whatever we're coming up with, makes a lot of sense to us until we start talking it out with somebody who's not inside our heads. So having having some people in your corner to support you can help you hash out some of the ideas that you might have. So Another area is stagnation of creativity. Collaborative environments often spark creative thinking through brainstorming sessions and open discussions. Isolation can limit exposure to to diverse perspectives, potentially leading to a stagnation of creative ideas. Now, you might not think of creativity as a medical provider, but hang with me because being a successful business owner requires creative thinking and problem solving at times. The lack of creativity in my mind when this happens is an indication of overwhelm and possibly being somewhere in the progression of burnout. Another area, weakened professional relationships. Building and maintaining professional relationships is more challenging when you work on your own. Networking opportunities, mentorship, and career growth can suffer as a result, right? When you work, if you work in a larger hospital setting or in a larger practice, you might not have this challenge, but when you're working on your own, you're doing all of it, right? And you're maybe don't have other providers on staff, or if you do, you're all busy. So here's some other things that come up. I mean, this is really important. Physical health. A lot of providers struggle with keeping and maintaining their well-being, right? So according to the CDC, isolation and loneliness have been linked to increased risk for heart disease and stroke, type 2 diabetes, depression, anxiety, addiction, suicidality, and self-harm, dementia, and early death. So not to, you know, want, want, not to be super negative here, but really to shine a light on what is possible, what could potentially be a downside to working in isolation. Another potential downside to working in isolation is emotional exhaustion. Constantly working alone and lacking emotional support from colleagues or contemporaries can lead to emotional exhaustion. Without outlets for sharing challenges and seeking advice, individuals might feel emotionally drained. So what can you do about this if you're not planning to work in a hospital setting or bring in a ton of providers to make up for working mostly on your own? Well, first things first. It's important to choose the kinds of social and professional relationships in which you want to invest your most precious resources, your time and energy. So we're going to explore different ways to expand your professional support network. First though, important here, get clear about the amount of time and energy that you are willing to invest in building relationships. I also invite you to ask yourself some questions. So here we go. What kind of relationships and support would you like? Getting clear about what you want and need most will help you find the right kind of support, and it'll save you a ton of energy in your search. Once you've established what will serve your needs, then you can consider what contribution you'll make. Do you prefer individualized support or group networking opportunities? Be honest and do your best not to censor or judge yourself. If you're currently lacking in air quotes here, extra time and energy, Uh, most of us are, make sure that you honor that. If you'd like to broaden your options and be part of a networking or professional group, how much time and energy are you willing to invest in integrating, building, and nurturing these relationships? Now, there's no wrong answer. And remember, you can always change your answers over time. Like your circumstances could change, your energy might, you know, increase or decrease. And so you may need to adjust along the way. So once you've gotten clear about this, Next, you want to identify what's missing and what you'd like most from a professional network. Do you crave the guidance of an experienced mentor who can share their experience so you can learn faster than you would on your own? Are you looking to expand your network and connect with other providers in your specialty? 
Do you prefer the convenience of an online community that provides flexibility and direct access to peers? Or are you interested in serving on an advisory board or committee? Now, whatever you choose, make sure that you are crystal clear about what would serve you best. And if you're joining a community or board, make note of what you bring to the table. The key here is to be clear about your needs first. Yes, I'm recommending that you take the WeFIM approach to expanding your network. What is WeFIM, you might ask? It stands for what's in it for me. We're so often looking outward to how we can support others to be of service. This is all really important. And when you're looking for a way to connect with a community or get the support, the right kind of support that you might need, ask yourself the question, what's in it for me? If I join this group, if I connect myself with this association, this organization, or I join this board, whatever it might be, what's in it for me? Start with that. And then make a list of what you bring to the table because that's important. But like really, really take some time to be fundamentally, I use the word selfish here in the best possible way, to be fundamentally selfish. Look to what you are looking for and look to match your needs up against it. So ask the WeFIM question, what's in it for me? Building relationships is like constructing a bridge to, prof to professional fulfillment. Now, without bridges, we have these vast chasms between us and our goals, which leaves us stranded on one side, longing for success or progress. And similarly, by actively seeking and nurturing relationships, we build bridges that connect us to opportunities, resources, and a supportive community. These bridges enable us to cross over from isolation to fulfillment, ultimately reaching our professional vision and goals. Now, there are various avenues to be in community with other provider owners. Networking can offer opportunities for collaboration, sharing best practices, and building professional relationships. So here are some ways that you can network with your peers. Take some notes if you haven't started already. Conferences and seminars. Attend a medical or dental conference. Go to some seminars and workshops focused on your specialty or healthcare management. These events provide opportunities to meet other physician owners, participate in panel discussions, and engage in networking sessions. Join a professional organization or association. You can join, some, join an organization or association that caters to physician owners. If you Google independent physician associations or IPAs, not to be confused with hoppy libations, mind you, you will likely find a group near you. We're here in North Carolina, we have the Independent Physicians of North Carolina group nearby in Charlotte. So uh, you could look into online communities and forums by participating in an online community and forum designed for physician owners. You could look to local networking events by attending local networking events, such as medical meetups, physician roundtables, or business networking groups, you can be connected with people in your, maybe in your area of specialty, or maybe simply, not just, but simply other privately owned practices. Um, these gatherings might be organized by medical societies, healthcare institutions, or physician-led organizations. You can certainly Leverage your existing network and seek referrals and introductions to other physician owners. Reach out to colleagues, mentors, or medical school alumni who may be aware of potential networking opportunities. You could explore joining or collaborating with physician-led organizations or groups that focus on healthcare management, practice ownership, or business development. Slightly different slant, maybe a little bit more focused on the business side. These organizations can often provide a platform for provider owners and connect you to collaborate on various initiatives. You could take to social media. Now, normally, I sort of say this tongue in cheek, right? Normally, I encourage my clients to move away from their devices when they're not working, but it may be helpful to engage in social media platforms like Twitter, or Facebook, or LinkedIn to connect with other physician owners. The way you can kind of connect with people is to participate in relevant discussions or start to follow influential individuals or organizations and share insights to establish connections. And then you can start, you know, DMing and, and getting to know people, possibly even scheduling calls, or if you're in the same geographic location, you can even meet up in person. 
You could look into mentorship programs that are tailored for provider owners. These programs will pair you with an experienced provider owner and help you when you're seeking guidance and will provide an opportunity for networking and exchange of knowledge. You could certainly uh, serve on advisory boards or committees related to healthcare organizations, medical startups, or indus- industry initiatives. Now, these roles can connect you with other practice owners who are passionate about shaping the future of healthcare. And I have to say, I would be remiss not to mention that we offer roundtable and masterclass gatherings in a community of practice with providers from around the world. We do this remotely, so it's super convenient. And it and by not being bound by geography, lots of doors open for shared learning, collaboration, and much more. You can sign up for updates on our events page of our website, which is tracytrapesky.com, if you would like to join us at our next gathering. So Building meaningful relationships takes time and effort, but the benefits of a strong physician owner network can be invaluable for minimizing isolation and maximizing your professional growth and success. No matter which route you choose, it's really important to be clear about the resources you're willing to invest in building your professional network. As I mentioned earlier, get clear about what you need most Then decide whether you're looking for individualized support or an opportunity to expand your network in a group setting. From there, determine your best fit. Ultimately, you can grow your professional network in a way that provides the right kind of support for you as a provider owner. Practice ownership and solo provider practices are an incredible resource for our communities, and your patients and community need you to be at your best. Make sure you prioritize and support your well-being in a robust way by building your bridges and nurturing your professional relationships. I hope you've gained insight from this episode. Before I sign off, I have a favor to ask. If you are a provider owner or practice leader, please take our five question survey to help us with our white paper research. We're writing a white paper for practice owners to address the challenges of being a provider and business owner, specifically the challenges of juggling administrative and clinical duties with patient care. We're interviewing 100 practice owners. That's our goal for our research. More if we can get there. And we would love it if you would take five minutes to support our research. Five questions, five minutes. Now, the working thesis of our white paper is that the current research about providers is limited at best and often does not address the challenges and needs of practice owners. We will use the results of our survey to write the white paper that will benefit practice owners and their teams from a business operations perspective. And we will be delighted to share the white paper with you when it's complete. To take the survey, you can go to our website, tracytrapesky.com, and click on the button that says, take our survey. Again, that's Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y, Trapesky, C-H-E-R-P-E-S-K-I.com. There's a clickable link in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening and for your unwavering support. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thriving Practice. I appreciate you. And I have an ask. If you got value from this show, make sure to share it. You can give a shout out on social media or tell your friends and colleagues about it. You can also subscribe so you never miss a show. To learn more about how we work with practice owners to help them take back their time, head over to tracytrupesky.com. While you're there, sign up for our newsletter, which has tips and tools for your practice success. A special thanks to our incredible team and thanks to you, our dear listener, for sharing the gift of your time and attention. I wish you so much success as you continue to move forward in your day. If I can be a resource to you, let's schedule a time to talk. You can find the scheduling link on our website.